Hi, my name is Justin, and I'm the executive pastor of Family Life here at GCC. And I just want to let you know that we believe this is your time. This is your time to worship. It's your time to serve. It's your time to grow. And I want to take just a moment to let you know what your next steps are. At the end of every service, we do something called Gen and Five. It's where we take just five minutes to talk about who we are as a church. We also have something called Connect Class, where we go in depth and we talk about the DNAs and the values of who we are. If you want to serve, we have something called Behind the Scenes Tour, where you can do just that. You can go behind the scenes of who we are as a church and find out where your spot is. And finally, we would love to connect with you as you connect with Christ at our Next Steps area. So no matter where you're at, we cannot wait to see you. You did it. Only a couple of you are crying. I knew, I knew you could do it. <laughs> you made it. Uh, so this is your time. We're all walking around with these shirts uh, because it's, our, our, our mission is the mission of the church. The mission of our church is to connect people to Jesus, a real person who lived and walked this earth, lived a perfect life. He came from God the Father. He's the Son of God. He died. He was buried in a tomb. He rose from the grave and appeared to over 500 people. And those people went on to change the world. And 2,000 years of church history, and it has been tried to... The enemy has tried to stomp it out, choke it out, and it's not working. The church is growing because Jesus is real. Our mission is connect people to Jesus. But our tagline here at church is this is your time. Uh, Because everyone's faced with a point in their life where they're ready to engage uh, Jesus in some way. And so we're wearing these this is your time shirts, everyone around, just to let you know, like, this is your time to connect to Jesus. And we'd love to help you do that. Uh, there was a time in my life, uh, there's a story even in my life that really relates to what we're going to look at. We're going to look at what is the most famous all-time parable that Jesus ever told. Jesus told parables. They were uh, earthly stories because people just love a story. And stories help us remember truths and things. And so they're, they're earthly stories that have a heavenly meaning. They're called parables. And I, I'm reminded of this parable, a time in my life where I did something, I, I did the unthinkable. I, I lost one of our kids. I know, some of you are like, I could see that. <laughs> Easy. You're so judgmental. Uh, J- Jennifer, I don't know what she was doing, but she was going out with a girlfriend or to get her hair done or something. I, I had the, the kids. Now, Riley's our oldest. And so oldest kids, we know what you're like, right? You know, you're, you're fat, you're, you're, you're task and you're focused on the task. And so Riley could play Legos for four days straight without sleeping if we didn't make him go to bed. Okay. He's, he's on it. And then Finley, Finley's the baby. Uh, Finley's up and moving. Any babies in the house? Babies of the family? Yeah, that's like you. Let everyone know. That's, that's like the baby's like, we know you're here. Okay. I, I never have to worry about losing Finley because I would hear Finley. He'd be talking someone's ear off somewhere. Okay. But the quiet ones, it's the quiet ones you got to watch. Aiden was about four years old. He's the quiet one. All I had to do was keep the kid in the house. Okay. He got out of the house. I, not, I have no excuses. I don't remember to this day what I was preoccupied with, but I had one job. Okay. Now, my immediate thought was, because I'm, I'm a good parent, I love my kid, okay? My immediate thought was, I have to save my kid, okay? But right underneath that thought was, my wife's gonna kill me, right? It was like, they came so like, oh no, my kid, I'm dead, right? Like, it was really close to one another. And, and my, one of Jennifer's gifts, truly, she, is, she loves to connect with people. And so I'm, we'd been living on this street for a couple of years. And so she knows every mom on the street, right? Some of them are in our small group. And so Lisa's over here, Tina's over here. And what I'm thinking is like, I've got to find this kid. But none of the ladies in the neighborhood can find out he's missing. I don't want their help. I don't need their help. I've got to, I've got to reel this in, right? And so I'm going, I'm like, Amen. And I'm, and I'm just like, I got to find him before him, Jennifer's friends do. And so, you know, a couple of yards, you know, we live like four streets in our little neighborhood. And, you know, I, I find Aiden wandering around. And sure enough, there are two moms. And they're like, <laughs> he's got that look like you are so dead. <laughs> they will. I mean, you lose. They will not let me forget this. I'm like, it's, we lost one kid one time for a little bit of time, babe. Like, <laughs> this is what happens in the story. The most famous story that Jesus ever tells is a story about 
uh, a child of a father who gets lost for a while. You've probably heard it. Uh, you, there's a word in the story that we don't use in our culture in any other time unless we're talking about this. The heading in your Bible is Luke chapter 15 is where the story is. The heading probably says the prodigal son. Now, the, the prod, you, you might know some of the tenets of the story because it's famous even in our pulp culture. You know, we'll talk about, oh, there's a prodigal son. We get it. It's a kid that goes off, squanders part of his life, wastes part of his life. He's got to come back home, you know, like, dad, I'm sorry. Like, you get the story. That, that's it. That's the story. But you don't understand probably the, the true meaning of the word prodigal. Okay, there, there's, there's a couple of nuances on this word. What, one of them is it's wasteful. Okay, that's, that's a very um, clear description. Probably number one ranked there is wasteful. Uh, there's another term that goes with this is like living lavishly or extravagant. Okay, so you, you could use this word in this way. When you go to Dairy Queen, you could say, I would like a prodigal amount of Oreo in my, see if that works for you, right? That's the proper use of the word, prodigal, lavish and extravagant amount. Another and like really close term that's used in here, and this is, this is accurate, is like it's something that is lacking restraint, that's somewhat out of control, out of bounds, running on its own, kind of running rampant, out of control, an area. And so uh, this is a story that Jesus tells about a prodigal. Now, there's something that you need to know as you're ushered into the story about who you are. Um, some of this is going to seem really natural to you. Like, I get that, I get that. Some of it might be a little bit new to you. Now, like, just open your mind and track with me. See, you, there are three parts that really make up the person that you are. One is very evident. Uh, your, your, the physicality of who you are, your body, is the first part. Your body is how you interact with God's creation. You know, the, the, the way that you can touch and feel and the concrete senses. This is the, the body part of your makeup. And we all get that from a very young age as we start to recognize what hot and cold is, okay? That's, that's one very definitive part. The next part is something you can, it's, it's a step away from the body and it interacts with the body, but there's something about it that's definitely a, a little bit farther away and that is your soul, now, maybe not the way that you've theologically understood soul. Let me explain soul to you in a very simple way what you'll get. Your soul would be your emotions, your thoughts, your memories, your feelings, that voice inside of you that's taking care of you, um, preserving your life, uh, talking to you, that's kind of leading you. That, that, is, that is your soul. Your soul and your body, they can interact with one another. And, and so there's even a part of you where you're like, I, I get that. I know my feelings. I know my memories. I know my thoughts. Uh, I know what my emotions are. I know how to interact with my soul. But there's a third part. And this part suffered a tragic death. See, when God tells Adam and Eve, and Eve in the garden, he says, if you eat of the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if you eat of that tree, you will die. Some people are like, well, they didn't die, so God doesn't keep his word. No, they did die. The third part of who they are died. See, we have a body, we have a soul, but we have a spirit. The spirit is the part of us that's created to interact with God, to interact with deity in our lives. And that part of Adam and Eve died. The relationship as they knew it with God, funeral over. They were no longer walking with him in the garden. I, I, I believe that many of us, and I, I was born with only two parts of who I was fully created to be. And until you come into contact with Jesus and God puts his spirit in you and you are born again of the spirit, that part of your personhood is really dead. And that the whole story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 15 is to illustrate that point. It's the final line of the entire story. I want to read it for you. Here's what it says. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, the first time that Jesus started telling the story, everyone sitting around him moved up on the edge of their seat because while this might seem normal to us today, this was, there, there's not another writing in ancient Mideastern uh, history that we can find that talks about this. Now, according to the book of Deuteronomy, the oldest son gets two thirds of everything the father has. He's entitled to that legally. The second son gets a third of it all. And so he's legally entitled to this, but it's a very awkward situation. It is as if the son is saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. 
But it's just, it's an awkward thing to say. So we've got this son that's like, hey, I want what's coming due to me. And so Luke chapter 15, verse 13, here's what happens. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now, this, this parable is one of the most depicted parables that Jesus ever taught in art. Uh, there's all kinds of paintings on it. Rembrandt's got two. I love this one of a young man on a horse. He's got his life in front of him. He's got all the stuff packed on the horse and he is heading off for a distant country. Here's one of the first things that we've got to just dispel. There is a, there is a, a lie that's here, okay? And it is this idea of FOMO. You know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. Okay, at some point in this guy's life, he's like, you're missing it, dude. There's this town over here in this distant country and they got it going on and your life is kind of good here, but it could be really good there. And this idea of this disenfranchisement and this spirit of discontentment starts to come into this young man. He's like, dad, I need what I got. I'm gonna pack it all up. I'm gonna get on my horse and I'm headed out because there's something better over there waiting for me. See, here's a lie that the enemy tells us. The enemy tells us in this lie, he says that there is not adventure Adventure and being with the Father and following the Father. That is a lie from the pit of hell. I, I don't think there's anything more adventurous you can do than make Jesus the Lord of your life and like set off on an adventure. My, my wife and I, uh, you could drop us in about any country in the world and we'll find someone that we know that went to Bible college with someone that we know that's doing a church that's radically advancing the gospel for Jesus Christ. We have traveled this country and traveled this world, got back from Israel four days ago. I don't know if you can handle the adventure Jesus has got for you if you get in. It's a life of adventure. And the enemy is telling you, FOMO, you're missing out on something. You're missing out on something. And this young man starts to believe that. Here's the next thing. You don't have to go to a distant country to be a prodigal in some way in your life. We all know that in our hearts, we can be a prodigal and walk away from the Lord. We can be a prodigal. And I, I, I'm, I'm telling you this, me, me included, all of us here today, there is, there is a part of our lives, every single one of us, where we are a prodigal in some sense. Every single one of us. See, the Lord, in, in his loving us, calls us to, to be with him. And the prodigal son here says, I, I've got fear of missing out and I want, I want something different. I'm gonna go out and do it. And, and we can be someone who's got our spirit that is alive and we can walk away in some areas in our life and we can have someone who's never had our spirit come alive and we can, we can be walking away. So we are all, in some sense, a prodigal. Now, I really wanna make sure that we, we get this here because it says, I'll just read it for you again. It says, he set off for a distant country and he squandered his wealth in wild living. And some of you are like, what, what, do, you, what, what do you mean wild living? What do, you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think I mean while living? Like, come on, like, you're looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. And so um, I wanna help you understand it a little bit. Some of you, you're like, this is exactly why I was afraid to come to church because this is, this is the treatment that I was afraid of is the glove treatment. <laughs> this is exactly what I didn't want to have happen. Some of you are like, as long as I'm not involved, you have my complete attention. <laughs> the guy's volunteering. Don't do that. You know, come on, that's weird. <laughs> See, I've got to tell you the truth, and the truth is that sin in our life, while it, it can be, it's, it not can be, but it, it is enjoyable for a season. God himself says that sin has a season that is enjoyable or fun. And the enemy, who's a real person, the enemy knows how to like make something that's attractive, okay, that's shiny. But the problem with uh, what this young man encountered when he gets everything on his horse and he's ready to go out and live his life is he thought, like we think sometimes, is that what he can do with his living is that he can do this. He can manage it. He can somehow like get in it and get a little bit dirty in it, but put it in a place and contain it and control it to a certain degree where it doesn't start to get on him or impact him. But what we all know is this, is that when you start to, to live wild and to do some of the things that our, our imaginations or a painting could just like uh, help us imagine what this kid got involved in, we all know from experience, if you've lived past kindergarten, that when you start to mess with it, it gets on you. 
Somebody like, he's ruining a church shirt. <laughs> I can't do that to a church shirt. We're, we're holy temples, and the truth is that we, we've done this with our lives, right? We're, we're created to be holy temples that the Spirit of God lives in, but we all know that we really can't fully control it. And the, the more we try to contain it or try to like clean it up and it gets on us and then, then other things that we touch, right? Other people that we touch, it just, it starts to, to become a bigger deal. And we can't make it shrink and we can't get rid of it. Matter of fact, Romans 3.23 says this about sin. It says that every single person has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All this kid did was he just went out to, to live his life and have a good time and figure stuff out. But what he found out was this. When you get away from the father, things get rough and unexpected things happen and you start to get messy. And what, what we do is we we do this relative thing where we're like, well, I'm not like, I mean, I've got some like gunk on me and I got some stuff in my life, but I'm not as bad as Hitler, right? I'm not as bad as like Charles Manson. Like, like think of some of these people and we're like, I'm not as bad as that guy. But Romans 3.23 says every single person has, has done this stuff in their life where they've, they've wasted some years. And this spirit of discontentment comes in and we're discontent with our house or we're discontent with our current job. We're discontent with our marriage. We're discontent with our situation in life. We're discontent with how we look. We're discontent with our car or our clothes. And like you, you get a raise, you've gotten a raise once before, right? You ever be like, I don't need one. I've already had one before. No, it's, it's, it's an appetite. It's a growing, insatiable appetite and we cannot control it. And the more we try to get out of it, the more mess we make of it on ourselves. We can't control it. God's word says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I know this is gonna blow your mind, but that means Mother Teresa. That means Mother Teresa has sinned. I mean, she's a great lady, never met her. But God's word says every single person has sinned and fallen short of his glory. This, this kid goes off and does all of this. See, your soul, your thoughts, your mind, your feelings, your emotions, they say, we got it under control. We can fix this. We can do this. We don't need the spirit of God living inside of us and telling us what to do all the time. We've got this. I know that I've wasted years. I've squandered years. I've squandered years with my kids working on things that won't matter. I've squandered years that I, I could have been a better husband to a wife that deserves more. If, if we all just take a mask off just for a second and in some way in our lives, every single one of us, we have to admit that we have, we've been a prodigal or we've wasted something because we've packed up all of our stuff and in our heart, we've gone to a distant country and we've just lived without restraint. Have you spent everything? That's what happens here. Luke chapter 15, verse 14, he says, after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I mean, for my grandfather loved pigs, farmed pigs, tried to farm pigs. If you're a pig farmer, I'm sure you're a great person. I mean, you, you've sinned. We covered that, okay? But you're good. You know what I'm saying, okay? So no offense to pig farmers, but if you're Jewish, that's like the low, that's, he's, he's down there, okay? But Jews, Jews, they don't mess with pigs. It's no, no, okay? So he's in, he's, he's at the lowest point he can possibly go. He says, I wish I could even eat what the pigs have to eat. He went to, he went to do for someone else, a stranger, what he would not do for his own father, work for him. See, sin promises freedom and brings slavery. It promises success and it brings failure. It promises life, but the wages of sin are death. That's what we earn by sin. Romans 6, 23 says that. The boy thought he would find himself, but he lost himself. When God is out of our lives, when the father is out of our lives, enjoyment becomes enslavement. I worry about 
this part of the story because at this very critical moment, some people say this, I know where I'm at and I know what's on me and I'm just gonna pitch a tent here and I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna live here. That's just what I'm gonna do because some, maybe some things have happened to you. I'm sure in a room this size, your, your physical father, your physical father beat you and then your, your stepfather molested you. And you can't picture going back home to a father. You know how the story ends. You've, 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 you've heard the big parts and you're like, I, I, I can't imagine it. So I'm just gonna pitch a tent and I'm just gonna stay here. And pride starts to swell up. See, there's something that happens in, in this whole thing where we lose our, our senses. And literally we get to the place where we can't hear God the Father simply saying, come home come home. You're tired and you've spent everything. Come home and I'll take care of you. And our pride begins to get in place and we lose sense, our senses. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, when he came to his sentence, his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's working this speech out in his head. He's like, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna tell my dad, I just wanna, if I could just come back in at that level, I would, I would, I would be okay with that. He's, he's working this whole speech up in his mind. See, here, here's the truth of the matter. Some some of us in this room, we grew up in the father's home in this story. Like, you know what the hallways smell like in the home of your father. You know what mealtimes are like. You know what it's like to walk with your heavenly father. But in some place in your life, in some area of your life, or your whole life, you've gone off to a distant country. And when you lay your head on your pillow at night and you have honesty with yourself, you know this that you are not in relationship with the Father and your spirit has been silenced or you've just snuffed it out and you've choked it out and you can no longer hear it. There's some of us where we, this is, maybe this is new, this is, maybe this is the first time that you've ever heard what Jesus would have to say about his Father and the Father's inclinations and proclivity towards how he would treat you. This is brand new, but even for you, if you don't have a memory of the fathers, there's, there's something on the DNA as God knit you in your mother's womb and he put you together. He put his personality and his fingerprints on your life. And you know that this is true, that there is a, a father and that there is a home and it's calling you, it's true. Jesus suggests here that when we're outside of the father's house, our senses are dulled. There's an insanity in sin that distorts God's image within us. And we've got a picture of God the Father that is just inaccurate. And somehow in our minds, God the Father is constantly upset with us. God the Father is always just a little bit agitated, preoccupied, or like doing something else. And he's just angry with us. He's agitated for some reason that we can't figure out. And we're afraid to interact with him because we don't want that disappointment again in our lives. And that is not who Jesus is describing in the Father. So we have to come to our senses. See, it's God's goodness and not man's badness that leads us to repentance. I, when, when the Bible's translated, uh, they put all these headings over uh, different parts of the Bible. I, I would say that, uh, that none of those headings are in the original text. And I think the heading that's in your Bible here is actually wrong. I think that uh, the most lavish and extravagant thing that happens in this story, the father does. The father is the prodigal, truly, in this story. Because one of the definitions of prodigal is to, to be extravagant and to lavish something. And what God lavishes out is this kindness. Romans 2, 4, Paul, who walked with Jesus, it says this in Romans. Do, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Paul's talking about the father. His forbearance and his patience, not realizing that God's Kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. 
See, the son is thinking this. If the father is good to his servants, maybe he's going to be willing to forgive a son. And he, he makes a critical decision. He says, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go. See, you might know how the story factually ends. You might have the information. But the father desperately wants for you to have the reality of the experience in your life. This is your time to truly see how Jesus is saying his father is. We got to get up and go. Luke 15 verse 20 continues. He got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. This had to have everyone on the edge of their seats. I'm just going to tell you what really rich Jewish men don't do is run, okay? They don't have to, okay? They're like, the father did what? <laughs> See, according to the book of Deuteronomy, which is the law uh, that, that God gave Moses, uh, they, they had a way of dealing with children that were completely disobedient. So if you're ever like, man, kids these days, kids, let me just tell you, uh, technically what happens here is they would be allowed, neighbors, if this kid comes back, to, to stone him to death because of what he did. So the father running out and he's really protecting his son because they would have to, they couldn't throw rocks so they would have hit the father. The son said to him, here's his rehearsed speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He was looking for the father's blessing and missing the father's heart. See, when you go home, what you get is you get a new robe. When you go home, you get a new robe. Here's how the story concludes. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. See, the ring that they put on him, it's not just jewelry. This is the signature ring for documentation that the family would use to do business. He pulls them back in as a, as a true heir. And I, I don't know what it's like at your house, but who do you think has the best robe? Who's got the best chair for watching football at your house? You all know, right? right? You're raising your hand, right? You, Dad's got the best chair for watching Like When he says, bring out, the, bring out the robe, bring out the best robe. When God brings out the best robe, this is so cool. The best robe that he has to clothe us with, to put on to us, to cover all of the junk that we've gotten into in a distant country, is his son. Jesus' righteousness, the perfection of Jesus is what God puts on us. He sends his best robe. You gotta, you gotta hear this. Galatians 3.27 explains it so beautiful. It says in Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. When we're baptized into water, this, this is the word they use here is baptizo. It means to fully submerge. They had a word for sprinkle. They didn't use it. The church didn't sprinkle for hundreds of years. They meant to fully submerge people underwater as adults who consciously make a decision to say, I can't deal with this and I need your help. And what we do in our baptism is we identify with Christ's death and we die to this stuff. And we come up out of the water the same way he came up out of a grave. And we identify with his victory over sin. And we are clothed. We put on the righteousness of God. This is why in a song we sang 15 minutes ago, I am the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of Jesus. Not mine. His. And if you've heard this story before and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm standing in a robe. This is really awkward. It's a prop. Work with me. 
You're like, oh man, he, bring a friend Sunday. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about sinners and people going up. No, 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 no. You, you, you are missing what this story is about. This story is not about how bad we are. This story is about how awesome God is in loving us and accepting us. Amen. That's what this story is about. And it breaks my, it, it breaks my heart. I ran across this in some research. The years after Christ's resurrection, uh, we, we got a document that's dated much later than this, but there is a similar story, but it contrasts drastically in the end, but there's a Buddhist story that lines up just the front part of this. There's a kid who gets some inheritance and runs away to a different land squanders it, wastes, wastes some of his life and comes back to the father. But when he comes back to the father, he's such a wreck that he doesn't recognize the father. So here's how this other story ends. Contrast this to who God is, as described by Jesus. In this Buddhist story, the father conceals his true identity and he lets the son come back and start to work. And after the son has spent a long time returning to a good moral position and being dutiful in all the things that he thinks he should do. Then the father says, it's me, you're welcome, come back as a child. This is not the description of our father. The description of our father is he sees you from afar and he runs to you and he clothes you with the best robe he has, his son. And he reinstates you as a meaningful part of the family. And he kisses you. And he misses you. And he loves you. And if you, if you are in a moment of honesty, you feel like in your life, you're back in that pig pen. And you're like, well, well then let God come and get me. He did. He literally did. He sent his son who sat at his right hand in heaven to come and experience a life like us. You know, that's beneath him, right? He sent Jesus to come after us. He is sending his Holy Spirit right now, says the book of Acts, to invade the deepest part of who you are and grab you and say, this is true. But your soul, your soul's like, make no decisions, commit to nothing. You saw the blue glove, right? We can control this. We got this. But the Spirit of God says, come home. Jen and I were not blessed with girls. We've got boys. We love them. We're gonna have to wait for grandbabies to get girls. The way we played hide and seek when they were younger is they would hide really well. And when I found them, they would have weapons and we'd fight. <laughs> this, this is boys. My buddy Rick has got girls. Rick says, man, Johnny, it's, it's, it's totally different. I'm like, tell me, I, I have no clue. Rick comes home from work and the girls want to play hide and seek. They're terrible at it. <laughs> it's like they hide in the same dumb place every time. Mom and dad's closet. And they laugh so loud. I know where they're at. They're like cackling and like I can hear. You. So, but you know, he's a good dad. He's like in the kitchen. Well, they're not in this cupboard, right? It depends on how, how tired he is is how long he can carry this out, right? He's like, they're not behind the TV, you know, and he's, he's playing it out. He gets to the top of the stairs. Those girls bust out of that room. They just can't take it anymore. They come running down the hallway. They say, you found us. You found us. Look, yeah, that is different. I believe that some of us just desperately want to be found. And you're tired. And you can no longer deal with the stuff that's and you're, it's too much for you to bear. And in some way in your life, if you're honest about it, you are, you've, you're, you're a prodigal. You've wasted some years. You've wasted some resources. You've wasted some time. You've wasted some energy. And maybe you're not tired yet. I, like how, how tired do you have to get before you say, I want my spirit to come alive? Can I tell you what coming home looks like? Coming home looks like this, that you say, I believe that Jesus is the son of the living God and that he came and he lived a perfect life and he was killed for it. 
He was buried in a tomb, but he beat death and he rose from the grave. That's called a confession. You confess that Jesus is the son of God and then you make him the Lord of your life. That means you gotta tell your soul, ah, no more. You're not in charge anymore. And the spirit of God comes and lives in you. And you wake up. You come to life in a new way. And part of that is obedience. You're obedient to baptism and you identify with him. You die to this stuff and you clothe yourself with the righteousness of this Christ. That's what coming home looks like. I don't know your prodigal story. I know that I'm, I'm in a continuous pattern in my life of just running back to the Father. He's good. He's good. He's not like, again? Seriously with this. He's like, I saw you coming. We're gonna have a party right now. I don't have time for your speech. Here's the ring. Here's the rope. Welcome home. Ye who are weary, come home. Are you tired? Come home. Have you never been home? Come home for the first time. We're gonna invite the band to come out and they're gonna sing a song. We we believe that God's word is alive and it's active and that the spirit of God right now in your heart is just saying, this is true, this is true. We think that when we read God's word that it, it, It needs a response from us. And so we're gonna invite you to have a time to just respond to that. Some of our staff, we're gonna be down front and I'm gonna, we know this is the international sign for leave me alone, okay? This means leave me alone. We know, okay? You don't need a staff member to come home to God. But every time Jesus called someone, he called them publicly. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. This is your time to come alive. Our God is a way-making God. He never stops working. He is still the God of miracles. And if you've been prodigal in some way, our Father is ready to lavish you extravagantly with his love. So we invite you. We invite you to stand right now as they start to sing. We invite you to come down. You can wave us off, we'll leave you alone. You can pray at the steps, or you can pray with us. We've been doing baptisms all day. The water's warm. We got swimsuits and towels, bags for your clothes. We've thought about the details. You have to decide if you wanna come home. Oh, Jesus, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit upon us. Give us boldness and courage to pick ourselves up out of the pen we're in and just come to you. And you meet us. You come running to us. And you lavish us extravagantly. And you put a robe of righteousness on us. Find us responding, Lord God. It's in your name we sing this. It's in your name we make decisions. If that's you, we invite you to come right now. Come home. Don't wait. Come home. Come on.